Hello, welcome to Lunch and Learn with Purse Strings. My name is Maggie Nielsen. I'm a partner here at Purse Strings, and we do these live sessions for you to meet our professionals and to learn how they are impacting um, so many great uh, men and women out there. Um, and so these are vetted and approved professionals. We call our Purse Strings approved professionals. Ed Combs is one of them, um, and we're so excited to have him on today to have this conversation about um, this couple and how they wanted a financial plan, but even got more uh, than what they were looking for and really were able to um, build their relationship even stronger. Um, so I'm so excited for this conversation. But before we dive in, Ed, could you give us a little intro of who you are and what you do? Yeah, thank you, Maggie. And hello, everyone. Thank you for having me here today. Uh, my name is Ed Combs. I'm the founder of Healthy Love and Money. And I'm kind of a unicorn in that I'm both a licensed marriage and family therapist and a CFP certified financial planner. And I bring those two things together in what I call therapy informed financial planning. So I love helping couples sort through those uh, sticky, thorny places in their financial life so they can move into greater uh, financial well being and what I like to call financial intimacy. I love that. Yeah. And I just love how many great professionals we have that have these like cross components um, because we know how much money. Um, and emotion go together. Um, and so having somebody who's well equipped in both these areas is just essential, especially when you're trying to work through some, like you said, thornier areas. Yeah, it, it takes multiple lenses for sure to really understand what's going on. Definitely, definitely. So anyone tuning in today, if you have questions along the way, throw them in the chat. Um, but first, Ed, let's talk about um, this couple that came to you. What was kind of their you know, issue, what was kind of the thing that brought them, you know, to the door, to the computer screen? Yeah, no, that's a great question. So they're a great couple. They're both professionals and they had relocated from one major uh, market to another. And with that, some job changes also came where he became more of the primary breadwinner. She stepped out of her high earning position and yet they didn't really adjust well to the decrease in income. Mm -hmm. And so he wasn't communicating that they were actually falling further and further behind in debt. And, and then finally it kind of came out and she was pissed. He was mortified that this had happened and they were trying to figure out how do we find our way forward from, from here. Awesome. Yeah. That's, um, that's hard. It's, and most of us don't want to always take a step back on our lifestyle or have those lifestyle changes. Um, but I know a lot of people don't want to bring this up to their partner, even though it's a combined problem um, that you're both facing and, you know, you know, just waiting any longer is just going to make it worse. Oh, you can say that again. Yeah. <laughs> and so, you know, when a couple comes to you like this, what are some of the first kind of things that you either dive into or discuss kind of just at that introductory level? Yeah, that's a great question. So when I'm first meeting with a couple is, you know, I, I'm going to get to know who are they a little bit more about how they've gotten to where they're at. And oftentimes when they're telling the story, it's a very narrow story, we like to say. And so I'm trying to stretch out the story to get more context or more details. And because it serves multiple purposes. One of the big ones, though, is it starts to create a little wiggle room. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, the person inherently, in this case, the husband was feeling really small and bad and like, I'm kind of this terrible husband for not addressing this better. I've created those problems and I'm going to pull back the bigger picture of, and, and also, so another thing is just normalizing that these life and money transitions can be really challenging and there can be other factors at play that may make it feel uncomfortable. So for them, they had had, so sorry, one of the first things I'm trying to do is just get to know their relational history. How have they talked about money in the past? Where have the pain points been? And for this couple, they had never really actively talked about their spending together as a couple. They just kind of went about paying bills, raising kids and doing careers. And so that was kind of the pattern they just took when they moved, but they never really slowed down to get coordinated. So once they could start to see that there was more factors at play, then like he just didn't want to tell me, uh, it started to soften. Yeah, definitely. And there is that, you know, shame or embarrassment, especially I've heard, you know, if you think, uh, you know, the man's role is always to be the head of the household and to make the income and those things aren't lining up, that's, you know, you feel let down um, in that situation. But also, if you don't know, you know, what you came from, you don't know where you're going to go. And so I like how you really open that up so you can kind of reflect um, so you can change moving forward. 
Yeah. And so that's kind of that, the next step is we're talking about the couple's journey, but then pretty quickly I'm starting to ask about their family history around money and what did they see in their families with mom and dad or mom or step parents, whatever their family constellation is around talking about money. And that's where we really start to see the patterns show up is they've never witnessed parents actually sitting down, having productive money conversations before. And so there's just no template in their brain for how to do this well. I think that's very common as most people don't. I mean, I know a lot of people who only see their parents fight about money. So it's like, let's avoid that because I don't want to fight. Um, no. But otherwise, even if there's no word, then there's no word. So you don't know how to like go about right. having it. What's what's productive? What's not? What do we talk about? What do we bring to the table? That's exactly right. And there's so many different mixed messages about money and what's appropriate to talk about or not talk about and so we hear a lot of the language that money is a taboo topic to talk about and we bring that taboo right into the relationship so you know i mean we're all adults here couples have seen each other butt naked <laughs> completely naked excuse my language i'm a fire former firefighter so you know sometimes that stuff comes out but but we've never actually looked at each other's finances yeah. and that's like fully looked at all the number of cards that we have, all the investment accounts we have, all the insurance types. And so we're really in this first phase of working together is just helping the couple get comfortable with being fully financially naked in front of each other yeah, and, and creating a safe place to do that. Because if, and that's really the first step is there's gotta be relational safety and security mm -hmm. before we start looking at the financial information. Because if I start opening up financial information more and more, but there's not relational safety and connection, more damage is going to be done because criticism um, is going to show up. There's a reason why you kept your clothes on, you know, is because you were afraid of it. Um, but yeah, I mean, you do, it is kind of getting financially naked with your partner. And it's amazing how we can do all these other things with our partner, you know, raise a whole other human with them, but we still don't want to talk about our finances. Um, and so you mentioned that, you know, when you talked about their family history, they never really saw positive money conversations. Um, and then, you know, in their marriage, they never really had, you know, connections about money and had those conversations. And so where do you lead them from here now that, you know, some of the history, some of the story, where they're coming from? Yeah, you know, I think one of the first things that I'm doing is starting to rebuild or restore the relational connection. And so one of my favorite activities that I do with couples, once we get a little bit of a, what I call a working relationship going, is I'll actually have them start spending more time facing and looking at each other and seeing each other. And this comes out of the field of attachment theory. In psychology, there's this whole study of attachment and bonding. And so I'm using that psychological lens to understand what needs to happen. And eye contact is highly provocative, yeah. but also highly bonding for us. As infants, that's, you know, that's how we know we're loved is when mom or dad look down and hold us, you know, we're bonding. But for quite a number of my clients, what I know is they don't have fully secure attachment patterns. Mm -hmm. They have what's called insecure attachment. And so part of my work with my couples is to help them start to repair those attachment injuries. And so we're spending time in the time that we're working together, actually looking at each other, seeing how much eye contact, are you noticing what's happening for them emotionally? Is the other partner noticing what's happening for you? Because that builds emotional reciprocity yeah deepens the trust further and further right and so we're always looking to deepen the trust and connection in the relationship as a as a base to then work on making financial change and decisions that are prudent for the couple i love how so much of it is not like we tore apart their budget and assessed it you know it's like we looked each other in the eye and had these real conversations you know which need to be had and to learn about each other and to get closer because, you know, in this specific situation, it is that married couple, you know, they are together, they're all, they're in this as a bond. Um, and so it's important for them to, you know, build that relationship. Um, so it's not even like, yeah, we assess the budget, but we, you know, we got some good eye contact and really, um, you know, almost had that therapy portion that you have. That's right. That's right. And so there's, it's, there's a bit of a intuiting or sensing when there's enough of that kind of restoring connection for the couple. Um, and from there, because what I do know is often they're going to have to change some of their financial patterns. And for this couple, one of the big things is they've gotten very used to going on very nice vacations. On dual income, they could easily afford it. Totally. But on a hit, the single income, they weren't able to afford it. And so, of course, practically, most people say, well, of course, you've got to do smaller vacations. 
But before we even did that, we talked about the meaning of vacation and mm. what they had experienced in their childhoods around vacation. And she grew up in a family where they never got to take family vacations because finances were very constrained. And so he knew that. And that was part of why he wanted to keep the nice vacations going, even though it was sinking them further into yeah. financial distress. So as we as we started to string together these different pieces, it made a lot of sense. For her, it was also understanding that he had learned in his own family to accommodate the wife. Mm -hmm. Never say no yeah. or restrict because anytime that he saw in his childhood, mom would get very mad at that. Yeah. So, you know, we're building and adding layers of depth here. But what happened is this couple, instead of me coming in as the financial money guy and saying, well, looking at your spending and budget, it's pretty obvious. You need to stop going on fancy vacations. <laughs> Now, I hope too many, not too many money pros actually just you know shake their finger, but I think there's some out there that that get pretty close. But they, from that place of knowing themselves and knowing each other, they were able to mutually agree that for the short run, we're going to go back to more modest vacations mm -hmm. so that we can get our financial life stabilized. And then, you know, in two to three years, once we're stabilized, then we can reevaluate where we're at. And maybe we'll return to going back to nicer vacations because that, that was still really a value for both of them. Yeah. Um, but they were able to make that mutual agreement together. And so it was far more sticky. And after they went on the more modest vacation, they both felt very gratified that they had stayed within their means together. And I, I love that you brought that into it because it sounds like he's doing this because he wants to make his wife happy. He knows this is something she's missing. You know, he wants to kind of fill her cup. And right. so it's never like, I'm trying to hide this debt from you. It's like, I feel bad that, you know, I wanted to give you this. I want to kind of fulfill that for you. And so really at the end of the day, it was all out of love. Not like we do this to be Instagram famous or, so, you know, something like that. But it was just out of like really wanting to build a relationship and give her what he felt she deserved and these different things. And so I like that it's not just like, we like to be lavish, but like, I wanted to do this for her. And now I feel bad that I can't provide that. Yeah, you know, and it's, I think one of the things I've really appreciated in my training as a therapist is really learning to look at the whole arc of the relationship. The couple had been together for, uh, I don't know, probably almost 20 years by the time that they came to me. And so over their journey of their life, you know, I, I'm getting their life story. I'm asking yeah. them about it. And she kind of got out of the gates early into high income and he was finishing up grad school. So she was mm -hmm. supporting him for a period of time. Yeah. So you add in that piece of the story and there was a sense of debt of gratitude that like, yeah. You made a lot of money. You supported me now. I, but I ended up in a career that's not quite as profitable as the one you were in. But then you wanted to stay home with the kids. So I said, OK. So as couples, we're making all these trade off decisions as we're going along course in time. And yeah. we're kind of trying to keep some sense of fairness balance for, for right. most people in their head. Right. Yes, of course, I know people say, well, yeah, but there's that one exception that all they think is about themselves. But for most of us, we're trying to keep some mental accounting of what's fair in the relationship, but we yeah. have a hard time quantifying and keeping it fair. So. Yeah. And you know, it's like, no, I, I was happy to help you through grad school and, you know, take care of you, or I'm, I'm happy to do this for you. I felt it, you know, I, it, I felt that it's my duty as a wife or whatever it may be, you know, I want to support you. Right. Um, and so there was something else that I wanted to touch on that I know we're in these notes here and that's that they've had, um, he was uh, in a recovery program before. And so how does this kind of take into your finances and reflect back into, um, you know, where they are today and kind of that, you know, recovery? Yeah, that's a great question. I think that that's part of what's been so interesting is I never thought that I would be working with people that had addiction issues mm -hmm. as part of financial planning. Yeah. Um, but what I know, you know, now from having spent years working in mental health, is that you know there's a good percentage of our population that has struggled with addiction at some level there's some percentage of our population that struggle with eating disorders at some level there's uh people that struggle with chronic major depression or anxiety or adhd is one we hear a lot about yeah and so what i'm sensitive to now is that people have had these complex journeys with mental health conditions that are at varying degrees of being resolved or addressed mm -hmm. and in some ways that's also a resource for addressing money. So when my clients have been in therapy, we're able to leverage what they've already learned about themselves and their healing and apply those lessons into their financial life. And so that was very much 
um, part of, you know, having worked in an addiction recovery program, he could draw on those concepts and see about what sobriety means financially. Yeah. How to be com completely clear and honest with himself about what's actually going on and being yeah. willing to work through the vulnerability of having to say like, I've had this problem. I need help. I feel out of control. Mm -hmm. All things that are taught in recovery programs. Right. Yeah. And, you know, recovery, I think, is another thing that a lot of people carry that shame, that guilt that don't want to talk about, you know, because it's not I don't it's just, you know, not talked about. And so it's it's interesting, though, when you bring it into these different scenarios, because these things can really reflect in other areas. But you can also use a lot of those same skill sets that you learned through a recovery, um, which is awesome as well. You're not always reinventing the wheel. You're just reapplying it somewhere else. Yeah, 100 percent. I think that's that's spot on is, you know what? I don't have to create a unique new therapy to address people's issues with money. I just need to use the therapeutic processes and practices that are already out there and translate it to people's relationship with money. Yeah. And so that, you know, as a professional, that's something I'm always kind of looking at. Uh, how can other areas of therapy help inform the way that I understand people's relationship with money? So people may be surprised to hear, but I study a lot from sex therapists. Mm -hmm. I study a lot from eating disorder uh, therapists because yeah. the patterns of and problematic patterns people face with with food and with sex are parallel many of the problems they they face with money. Yeah. I, I mean, I can definitely see that and like through, you know, people in my life or just the fact of like binging or splurging or, you know, these different things where it's like, it's very almost extreme, um, which is what you're kind of trying to manage there sometimes. And so I can definitely see how that plays out in your finances. And I also know, you know, if you're not in the best mental state, you know, from a different, um, you know, whatever you're going through, it kind of reflects in your finances as well. Yeah, 100%. And I think it's, that's the thing is wherever we go is where we're at. Yep. How we're wired shows up in all the areas of our life, not just in one area. How fun. I mean, so the good news is to some extent, like growing and changing can then be used in all the areas of your life. Yeah. The challenge is we actually have to be intentional about how do I take how I'm growing in my relationship with food and translate those lessons into my relationship with money. Right. You know, how do I grow and change in the way that I'm dealing with my sexuality and my sense of comfort of who I am, what I like, what I dislike, how I communicate that with my partner, yeah. right? Those things translate directly over to money, giving and receiving consent, yep. feeling vulnerable with someone. Yeah. Yeah. So, it's, it's super interesting, you know, and just, yeah, having both sides there, um, you, you could really see that play out in a lot of people's lives. And so... It sounds like, you know, they kind of cut back on some of those higher vacations. They were able to kind of have more conversations about this. Um, so what are kind of like the results that came out of, you know, working with you of, you know, you know, were they able to get out of the step? Were they able to kind of get back on track or, you know, did she pick up a, a, a job that's higher paying? You know, how they kind of go about this? Yeah, that's a great question. So as time progressed, and just for listeners to have some sense of what's the time progression here, this is yeah. probably over about a 12, 12 to 18 month period of time of meeting weekly, initially the first three months or so, and then every other week after that. So this is not what you're getting as a time lapse story, but <laughs> you know, it, it happened over a period of time. But you know, as they were going through that change and growth process, they realized they had also bought into a house that didn't actually reflect who they were, but who they thought they should be. Yep. So they sold the house, they bought a smaller house that felt more reflective of who they actually are and how they want to be in the world. Um, so that also helped them alleviate a lot of the debt. She started working more part-time. You know, she fortunately had um, highly valuable professional skills that she could contract out. Um, yeah. So that was a big win for them. Um, but it was also recognizing they were moving into a new life stage as the kids were getting older right that need to be home with them and supporting them in the ways that she had been so she was feeling more comfortable to kind of allow the kids more autonomy for her to step back into more of a professional identity um, and so they together were much more comfortable with each other you could see the ease with each other when they would sign on especially in the later months yeah uh, their overall household net worth improved uh, significantly and what was challenging is they were also trying to figure out what does it mean to become wealthy? Mm. Because neither of them grew up in wealthy families. Now, part yeah. of what came out is his father was actually quite financially secure, with lots mm. of money. His dad had always said, 
there's never enough money. I never have enough money. And they never lived as if they had money. They kept cars for a very long time, modest clothes, modest housing, no fancy vacations. So, you know, there, but there was this aspirational side of like, I want to build net worth. What does it mean? And, you know, as it went on, realizing like, yeah, we, you, our financial planner working with like, I didn't think we had enough money to need to work with a financial planner. And that's something I hear a lot is, yeah, I didn't think we were making enough money to need a financial planner. And so, yeah, I mean. I mean, it sounds like, yeah, they've made great progress. And it is that, that, you know, I want to be wealthy is, you know, is that just all my bills can get paid on time? Is that, you know, my retirement's fully funded? Is that, you know, we could buy three houses and go to Europe, you know, twice a year? Like, what's the level that you're looking for? Right. Um, because, I mean, there are loved ones in my life. I'm like, I know you have money, but everything is like, we never have enough, you know? So it's like, mm-hmm. it, it's hard to kind of go from there. Um and so how are things kind of either monitored or what's your relationship kind of now with them? Do you still meet bi-weekly? You know, do, you, do, do they not need your services? You know, what's kind of that um, ongoing relationship look like? Yeah. So this particular couple that I've been talking about and, I've you know, the details, you can't figure out who they are. I think I've not shared enough, but they they have transitioned on in their life and they're working with other people now. And, and that's yeah. great. Um, but you know, I think what happens in, in aggregate as I'm doing my work now is we meet more intensely in the beginning and then it starts to slow down. And then in my ongoing work with clients, the intention is, you know, we'll meet as you need to meet. Um, so that it's really nice that people can go from this high level of distress around their finances and really no sense of clarity on how to move forward to we're clear, we're enacting the choices that we want. We have a, a path forward. We have someone that knows our financial life and our story. Yeah. And now we can just call them and say, hey, we're up against this decision. Can you help us walk through thinking about it? It's always the best part. I mean, I know like even when I've been to therapy before, you know, the first couple of sessions, you're like, well, I got to give you the backstory of the past, you know, 20, 30, 40 years. But like now it's like, since you know all the you know all the players in the game, you know kind of the situation. You know that Aunt Sally's a nut, but she calls me up all the time. Like right. you can kind of just dive into those problems when they start happening or whatever situation arises. Right, that's right. Yeah, and I think that's that's part of the. I think that's one of the values from therapy that I'm really excited to bring forward into the financial planning world. You know, many of my financial planning colleagues often say, "Well, we're like a therapist." And I'm kind of thinking, like, well, and some ways you talk to people about their life and stuff, but the depth that they can get to is not nearly as deep as what a therapist can fully get to. And so being able to bring some of the depth of the therapy world into the financial planning process, I think has a bigger impact for folks. Definitely agree. Yeah. And so um, I know we just talked about, you know, one couple in their situation here. And so they started with weekly and then bi-weekly um, and then now they're kind of doing their own thing. What does like a common kind of relationship look like when working with you? Is that always the weekly, bi-weekly, and then you kind of help with ongoing financial planning or do some people just come for a plan? Do some people just come for therapy? What's kind of your uh, layout or your dynamic? Yeah, that's a great question. So what I'm so excited about now is being able to work in a very integrated way with clients. And it is pretty much when we start out, we're meeting weekly to get the ball rolling and yeah. really collecting as much financial information as possible into my financial planning software. And, and so for people that are unfamiliar with this, that means I'm collecting information about your, your cash flow, your spending accounts, your investment accounts. I'm getting your tax statements. Mm-hmm. I'm getting your insurance policies, any uh, 529 type accounts. All of that comes into the financial planning software. And so that really helps me see your whole financial life in perspective. And then we start to talk about what's going on. So a recent client that I'm starting with, they they connected all their accounts and they had something like 14 different credit cards. Oh. And, you know, a handful of them had very small balances. Um, And this is not uncommon. This is not unique to this individual. But as we're talking about it, is their family had to flee dire spaces and they had adopted a have as many options open as possible at at any one time yeah give them a sense of safety so they just carried that forward with them and so instead of me just saying well shut them all down this is ridiculous it was more reflective like okay well why is that 
and they hadn't quite connected those dots. Mm -hmm. But it's like, we can move towards a simpler approach and still have access to money to help you feel secure. Right. Um, so yeah, and then, you know, as we're developing the plan, we're getting into financial clarity, um, the frequency uh, tapers out and yeah. it's more ongoing monitoring. So most people are coming in some type of crisis or distress. Yeah. And then once we get them stabilized, then it's just ongoing care. So, uh, you know, my wife's a dentist, right? Okay. And, and so I make a lot of dental analogies because that's just what runs through my head. But, you know, when you go to the dentist, you know, they do a full evaluation of your mouth and your oral health and they figure out what's going on. And if your teeth are overall pretty healthy, then you go see the hygienist every six months. Yeah. Dentist pops in, checks the x-rays, makes sure everything is still good. And on you go caring for your teeth. Yep. But if you have a root canal that you need or a cavity, whatever, then you know, she gets in, she works through that, helps your mouth get stable and healthy again. And then you stay in care and keep yep. going and maintenance. And I think that model is also remembering that I want my, I don't want to take over my client's financial lives. I want my clients to be empowered in their financial lives. So you're going out, you're living your financial life, and then you're just coming back and doing a spot check. That's a great analogy. Cause like the dentist is like, I don't want you to have 500 cavities, you know? Right. I, I don't want that for you, but I got it. We got to make better whatever's wrong right now. It's yeah, a great we analogy. Got we got to take care of those those things because otherwise what we know is it's going to your mouth will continue to deteriorate it will yeah. continue to get worse if you don't tend to it and that's Which the same lead to bigger problems and more expensive problems yeah right and so that's where the prevent financial planning can really be preventative and proactive and this really opens up a whole nother door for a lot of folks is balancing their historical self who they've been with their present who they are and their future self, who they want to be. Mm -hmm. Most of us are oriented in one of those directions, but there's blind spots to being future oriented. Yep. Those folks are often very good at saving for the future, but they have a really hard time living in the present. Yeah. People that are very present oriented have a really hard time making plans for the future and imagining they have a future self. They're like, you mean I'm going to be alive in five years, 10 years, 20 years? And sometimes there's very understandable reasons. Maybe they had a parent die at a premature age. Yeah. Uh, maybe they had some other types of childhood trauma that really gave them no sense of going on into the future. Um, and then people that are, you know, looking backwards, like they understand their past and how it's all going, but they, they're forgetting that they still have a future ahead of them. Yeah. So, we really like to try to help people reflect on their past so you can learn the lessons from the past that you need to, so you can live in the present and plan for the future. Love that. Yeah. That's awesome. I think, you, yeah, you're really helping your clients and, and just this with the therapy informed, it's just so much more eye opening because all these things are so integrated and sometimes almost like going to the doctor, you know, they really silo some things out, you know, it's like the ears, nose and throat. It's like, well, that's all connected here. Like it's all here, you know? And so, um, you know, it's it's just great having this all integrated because it is some of this, the past and the present. So um, somebody asked, have you all discussed how to rid yourself of the scarcity mindset? Do oh. you have any tips on that quick? <laughs> yes. I, thank you so much for asking that question, because that is, I think, one of the biggest challenges that we come up against in the yeah. field of financial therapy is how do you work? from what's commonly referred to as the scarcity mindset into what's commonly referred to as an abundance mindset. Right. And, you know, I think sometimes it gets framed as this very black and white. I either have a scarcity mindset or I have an abundance mindset. And so one of the first things that we can start to do is say, no, this is a progressive incremental journey. And at least my experience is, I don't know that we ever fully get rid of the scarcity mindset. I think we can grow mm -hmm. into having a more abundance um, opportunity based mindset, but um, that's a progressive journey. And so one is just kind of recognizing this is a progressive journey to take that has many yeah. facets to it. And the more you learn and grow, the more nuanced you'll get about understanding what that means. Um, so, I mean, one, being able to recognize you have also a scarcity mindset, but two, it's not irrational. Yeah. And I think we can beat ourselves up for having it and feeling like it's irrational neither of which are true from my perspective 
Definitely. Yeah. But understanding that you have it is really always the good step of then understanding how to move forward, I think. And it's not like a flip of a coin of like your head or your tail, your scarcity or your abundant. It is, like you said, that spectrum. Um, and so I think you just always want to be improving and be more abundant, what, 51% of the time over half? Yeah, well, it just you can use that subjective. You can say like how much of the time, if it's zero right now, what's it like to be one or two percent? Yeah. Okay, once I maintain one or two percent, what's it like to be three or four percent incremental? And this is right because our identity and the way we relate to money, a lot of people think and this is Ed's perspective on the world. Maybe there's some science that supports it, but uh, many people play lottery thinking that's going to solve their problem. I'm just going to dump money into my life and then I won't feel so scared of not having enough money. But what I know is there's a lot of wealthy people, whether from lottery or job success, where they have not overcome their scarcity mindset. And so part of understanding scarcity mindset is understanding it's not a money issue as much as it is a psychological experience, uh, reality. And sometimes it's multi-generational, meaning the scarcity mindset didn't start with you. It started one, two, three generations before. And so we can expand or stretch that. So there's, so that's one layer is recognizing it's multi-generational, but then we're going to bring it right down into our body and say our nervous system is wired into scarcity as well. Yeah. And so we have to become very aware of what's going on in our body that, um, and learn how to work with body responses that say, this is dangerous, threatening, scary. Uh, and figure out how to bring calm to it. So one of the most practical things people can do is when you're feeling a sense of uh, fear in your body is to bring one hand to your chest and one hand to your stomach and just take a couple of deep breaths and take a look around your environment and check and see, am I safe right now? Mm -hmm. Am I okay right now, here and now? Because such a large part of scarcity mindset is drawing on old memories and old stories, maybe not on present reality. Yeah. So if we can let our body know that it's safe now, there's not the money bear <laughs> behind the closet or at the cash register, or the money bear is mom or dad that's going to smack your hand at the can candy thing and say, we don't have money for that. I mean, that's terrifying for a child. Yeah. As an adult, we can kind of laugh about it but our nervous systems become very encoded to what's safe or not safe. So we really, I, I'm becoming a much bigger fan of working at the nervous system level um, because yeah. we live in our bodies from the moment we're born until the moment we die. Definitely, yeah, it was great, great answer. And I know um, reading some about the nervous system, you know, we get excited like a, like are worried, almost like a bear is chasing us, you know, that fight or flight where it's like, okay, there are no bears around me. There are no lions. I am in a safe place in my home. Like. Yeah. We don't we don't need to be on that high alert right now, you know, and so yeah, just getting back to your breath back to your body back to just, you know, you're in a safe space is is super essential. Yeah. Um, well, Ed, you have given us a ton of great information today shared a great story, um, how you're really helping your clients through this therapy informed financial planning. Um, I know your email has been going through the bottom here, um, ed at healthyloveandmoney.com. Is there any other way that you like to um, connect with people, either Instagram, podcast, anything like that? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm on Instagram at healthyloveandmoney. Um, and then I have a podcast and a blog that are available through my website. But the podcast, obviously, you can also get it through all the major streaming services. So I'd love to have you download and listen to some episodes there. Awesome. And you can always check out Ed on our site, purstrings.co. Um, and don't be afraid to reach out to him. I know he offers a 20 minute free, you know, consultation to make sure it's a good fit for everybody. Um, and so let's jump in to have the conversation started and, you know, breathe a sigh of relief. Um, so thank you again, Ed, for being here today. And we'll talk to everyone again soon. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Bye. Bye.